Greetings and welcome to the introduction to astronomy. In this video, we are going to talk about the last hundred years, the last century's worth of astronomy, and hopefully give you an idea of how things have changed over that time. So let's go ahead and get started here. And what we see is, you know, what do we know about astronomy over this? But there has been great progress in astronomy over the past hundred years. If we think about it, general relativity, our current understanding of gravity is only a little over a hundred years old. So if we think what we think about is that this this uh, discussion will give us uh, an understanding of what we have learned about since general relativity and over the last hundred years or so. So this will not be complete. Obviously, I can't go through everything that's been discovered over the last hundred years, but I try to hit on some of the very important topics that have been covered. So let's go ahead and get started here with these and we'll go back to the 1920s. So what was discovered in the 1920s? Well, one of the things that was discovered in 1923 is that Edwin Hubble determined that the Andromeda, Gal Andromeda Nebula at the time is actually a galaxy like our own Milky Way. What he saw were variable stars in images that he took of the of the Andromeda galaxy. And because he was able to determine that they were Cepheid variables, like those in our own galaxy, he was able to use them to determine distances. So prior to 1923, we did not know for sure that galaxies like our like the Andromeda or what were called spiral nebulae were actually galaxies like our own. In 1925, we saw uh, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin gave us the idea and showed us that the hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. I'll tell you many times that hydrogen makes up 90% of the atoms in the universe. But this was not determined until analysis of spectral lines by uh, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin working on her uh, thesis that showed that the abundances of hydrogen were tremendous. And it was something that was very difficult to accept at the time. And she had to even put a disclaimer that said that this could not possibly correct be correct. But it turns out that it was. And in 1925, we did learn that hydrogen was the most common element in the universe. Also in the 1920s, we learned that uh, from Edwin Hubble that uh, coming back to Hubble, that he determined that the universe is expanding and that distant galaxies are receding even faster. So prior to this in the before the 1920s, we did not realize that there were other galaxies, that hydrogen was the most common element in the universe, or even that the universe was expanding. Now as we move on, to the 1930s and see what we can what we learned there. First thing to be discovered in 1930 itself was Clyde Tombaugh shown here discovered Pluto and Pluto uh, at that point was considered the ninth planet and was actually detected by searching a very careful search looking for an object out beyond Neptune. A couple of years later, in 1932, uh, Carl Jansky was able to bring us the beginnings of radio astronomy. And we see his initial radio telescope here. And he detected radio waves from the center of our galaxy. And that opened up a whole new field of radio astronomy before 1932. The only astronomy that was done was through visible light. Now that has expanded and now we can look at radio waves from space as well. A year later in 1933, we saw that neutron stars were discovered or were at least theorized that they could exist. And Walter Bada and Fritz Zwicky described the neutron star that would form in a supernova collapse and that is now known to exist at the center of things like the Crab Nebula here. And a few years later, towards the end of the 1930s, we found that um, we learned what stars were, how stars produced their energy. And that was something uh, important. Hans Bethe uh, gave us the method of nuclear fusion that we use today, where essentially four hydrogen atoms go through a process and become a helium atom. 
And that is the nuclear fusion that powers the stars. But prior to 1938, we still were working on trying to understand how the stars could be powered. Now as we move a little uh, further, uh, we'll come into the 1940s and early 50s. And let's take a look at some of those. In 1948, we had the Palomar telescope seen here. And that was the largest telescope in the world for three decades. Um, in the later in the 19 uh, later into the 1950s, a decade later, we find that Sputnik one was launched. And we can see that here. So Sputnik one being launched and that was the first satellite. So here is an image of uh, a simulation of uh, Sputnik. So we can see a picture of that here. And that was the start of the space age. And we're going to see a lot of what comes next will be based on that. A little while later, we actually uh, just two years later in 1959, Luna 2 and Luna 3 explored the moon, uh, crashing into the surface and imaging the far side. So Luna 2 crashed into the lunar surface the first time we put something on another planet. Luna 3 actually gave us an image of the far side of the moon for the first time. So before that, we had not known what this had looked like what the far side of the moon had looked like. And while this is not a great image, it still was very important for our understanding of the universe. What were things what were things like on the other side of the moon? Until 1959, we did not know what the far side of our nearest neighbor in space looked like. And then in 1961, just four years after the first uh, artificial satellite was launched, we had the first humans to orbit the Earth. And we show here an, a memorial to those, but that was the first humans to Earth. And only less than a decade later, we would actually put uh, men on the moon. Now, as we look through the 60s, we're going to see things start to break down a little bit more here, uh, just because so much was going on. And in the 1960s, in 1962, just a year after we put a first human in space, we also saw that Mariner 2 shown here became the first craft to visit another planet and it went to Venus and flew by Venus. In 196, also in 1962, Martin Schmidt was able to discover that quasars are actually active galaxies and therefore the most distant objects. Quasars are quasi-stellar radio sources, meaning they looked like stars, but were eventually found to be supermassive black holes receiving a lot of material and giving off tremendous amounts of energy. These became the most distant objects known in the universe tracing out to 10 billion light years or more away. A few years later in 1965, uh, Penzias and Wilson, uh, shown here, were actually discovered the cosmic microwave background. This was a prediction of the Big Bang. So the Big Bang predicts that this should be here. And we found this remnant in 1965 that they found when studying the sky with their telescope, not looking for it, but actually uh, looking to get the minimize the amount of noise. And they found this background noise that was coming from everywhere in space. And that was the discovery of the background radiation, which was a big piece of evidence towards the Big Bang for the as the model for the origin of the universe. Um, in 1966, we had the first soft landing on the moon. I mentioned a landing on the moon. The first one was a crash into the moon. But this was Luna 9 actually gave us the first soft landing on the moon. And as we move onward, then we see into the next region, we'll look at the 19, late 1960s to the early 70s. And a lot went on there as well, as we see. First of all, Jocelyn Bell gave, discovered the first pulsar. Uh, we looked at the idea of neutron stars, but the first pulsar was actually discovered in 1967, looking at radio emissions. In 1968, 
And just remember, we're only we're less we're only seven years from the first man in orbit. And now we have the first manned flight to the moon. So we actually traveled to the moon this time. And that was the Apollo 8 mission that traveled and went around the moon and came back. So they didn't actually land on the moon, but again, were the first people to see the Earth from the distance of the moon and to see even this case, just a partial phase of the moon. Now, just one year, just a year or so later, we did have the first manned landing on the moon shown here. This would be Apollo 11 landing. And that was the first manned landing on the moon in 1969. Again, just eight years after the first person was in space. Now, not everything had to do with the moon as our last couple did, but there were also a lot of other things going on. In fact, the Uhuru satellite was launched in 1970. And this again, like radio astronomy by Carl Jansky, opened up another window on the universe. This was the first time we could actually study x-rays from space. So we were able to look at what x-rays were doing and that's important because they are unable to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere to be seen from the ground. And also in the early 70s, we had the uh, Salyut 1, the first space station was launched. So our first space station and a precursor to the International Space Station today. Now throughout the rest of the 70s, we had of course more things going on. Uh, first of all, in, the, in 1972, uh, Charles Thomas Bolton actually identified Cygnus X1 as being a great black hole candidate. So we can see the black hole with the disk of material spiraling around it here in this artist's conception. But the first measurements based on the orbit of the mass showed us that the mass of the object there at the center of that red disk had to be too massive to be anything but a black hole. A little bit uh, in a couple of years later, in the mid 70s, we got our first images of the landing on Mars, uh, sorry, the landing on Venus. And that was images of Venera 9, sending back images of the surface of Venus. So that was a chance to really see the surface of Venus for the very first time because it is constantly shredded, shrouded in clouds. And the following year, 1976, we had the Viking landers on Mars, which were landers were able to explore Mars in detail and begin to look for signs of life. And their initial signs, their initial searches for life were unsuccessful, but we still look for that today. The following year, in 1977, Voyager 1 and 2 were launched to explore the outer part of the solar system. Uh, Voyager 1 would visit Jupiter and Saturn and Voyager 2 would go on the grand tour not only visiting Jupiter and Saturn but also Uranus and Neptune visiting four planets and giving us our only knowledge to date of the two outermost planets in the solar system. In 1977 we discovered the rings of Uranus. And those were discovered when Uranus passed in front of a star and the star dipped in brightness as it came close to Uranus. So as the planet passed here, it would get dips in brightness as it passed each of these rings before it actually dipped out completely as it passed in front of as passed behind the planet as the planet passed in front of the star. So that was something important because Voyager 2 was launched about that time and Voyager 2 would get a chance to actually study the rings of Uranus and now we knew in advance that they were actually there. In the later uh, later 70s and through the 80s we were continuing to make again great strides and what we find in uh, first of all is the confirmation of dark matter by Vera Rubin in 1978 and we found that dark matter was a very important part of the universe and makes up a lot of the matter. The vast majority of the matter in the universe is some kind of mysterious dark matter that is quite different than the ordinary matter that we're used to. Uh, in 1983, we launched a satellite to study the sky in the infrared. And that was the IRAS satellite. 
and we were able to do that that was able to then study the sky in the infrared for the first time. Now we could do a little bit of infrared astronomy from the surface of the Earth and from balloons and high flying aircraft that this was the first satellite permanently in orbit that was able to study the uh, study the sky in the infrared part of the spectrum. In 1986, we visited Uranus for the first and only time. So we were able to see Uranus for the first time and study its rings. A couple of years later, Voyager 2 made its way to Neptune and was able to study Neptune for the first first and again, the only time we have actually looked at Neptune up close. And we cannot see it with near this kind of detail from the Earth. And then finally, in this section, we saw Venus for the first time in great detail. We'd already seen a few images of parts of the surface of Venus, but we'd never been able to map the surface. And in 1990, the Magellan spacecraft mapped the surface of Venus, not with visible light because we can't see visible light through the clouds, but with radar and able then to understand the surface of what the surface of Venus was like. Now, as we continue on getting into the 90s here, and what we see is one of the very early things in the 1990s was, of course, the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. So that was a very important uh, thing at Hubble, uh, still going as, at, as we speak right now. And that has really opened up over nearly 30 years worth of studying of the sky. In a couple of years later, in 1992, uh, Kobe, the Cosmic Background Explorer, was launched, and that detected ripples in the radiation from the very background radiation of the universe. These ripples were actually then tell us something about how the very earliest structure in the universe formed. The same year, we actually had the first confirmed discovery of an exoplanet. So think about that. Prior to 1992, we only knew of the planets in the solar system, and that was it. This was the first discovery of a planet, first confirmation of a planet outside of our solar system. Um, in 1998, we began construction of the International Space Station. So International Space Station seen here in a more complete sense was actually started in the night in night in the late 1990s. And also in 1998, we made the discovery of dark energy. Dark energy has been found to cause the universe which we knew was expanding, but caused the expansion to accelerate, meaning that the expansion is increasing at an increasing rate. So the velocities were slower in the past and are getting faster and faster as we head into the future. And this gave us that discovery that dark energy along with dark matter make up about 96% of the mass and energy in the universe. Well, let's move into the uh, new the new millennium here into the 2000s and what we find some of our discoveries first of all in 2005 a uh, we found the uh, Eris was discovered and Eris was another object in the Kuiper belt much like Pluto and part of that led to in 2006 that the International Astronomical Union formally defined what a planet and a dwarf planet were. So that made that there were eight planets and we now have at this recording five dwarf planets that are known. Uh, the eight planets uh, being the standard planets that we know Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars in the inner solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune in the outer solar system and the five dwarf planets including Pluto. So we had actually never defined previous to that we had never defined what a planet was. And now we have found far more. So there are other dwarf planets such as Eris, which was discovered in 2005. But also Makemake and Haumea were discovered. And Ceres was considered and moved into the class of a dwarf planet as well. In 2012, we got the first confirmation of 
black holes. So first visual confirmation of black holes by Suvi Ghazari. And that gave us visual proof of the existence of black holes for the very first time. And in 2013, we actually discovered an extrasolar asteroid, meaning that this is not an asteroid that was part of our solar system, but something that came from another solar system and traveled through interstellar space and came close to our solar system to be able to be studied. So it was the first time we had seen an interstellar asteroid. And then as we continue, and look at the more recent discoveries uh, 2015 through 2017 and what we see is that first of all in 2015 New Horizons explored Pluto and gave us our first images of that dwarf planet from Earth we could only see a very small amount of light and dark detail but could see no de no great detail of it and that continued on New Horizons continued on and in 2019 actually explored Ultima Thule and continued its mission and was able to look at another much smaller object out there in the Kuiper belt. Now what else we saw we did get in 2015 also was the first detection of gravitational waves. Now this was a prediction of Einstein's relativity his general relativity from about 100 years before. However, they were too faint to be able to be detected. And it wasn't until 2015 that we had sensitive enough instruments that we could detect the gravitational waves from two colliding and merging black holes. And in 2017, we actually were identified, were able to identify the source of gravitational waves from colliding neutron stars. So and we see an artist conception here two neutron stars colliding together to form a black hole. And we could see that not only in gravitational waves, but now we were able to identify it in optical and in other wavelengths. So the progress in astronomy will continue. These are just some of the things that we have done over the last hundred years in astronomy. And as you go through an astronomy course, you have to think about all the things that you learn and how little of that was actually known even a hundred years ago. So let's finish up here with our summary. Again, just to kind of summarize what we looked at just 100 years ago, we did not understand galaxies or what they were or how the stars worked. Those are things that we have only led uh, learned about recently. The space age gave us a revolution in astronomical discoveries able to observe at other wavelengths. Um, so we could observe x-rays and infrared and other wavelengths that we could not observe 100 years ago and able to directly explore the planets, not just through telescopes here on Earth, but by directly going there. And of course, new discoveries are coming. And who knows what the next big discovery will be. So that concludes this lecture on a century of astronomy. We'll be back again next time for another topic in astronomy. So until then, have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in class.